So uh, welcome to the first uh, both Birth of a Feather uh, session of ADAS 2020. Uh, we have the pleasure of uh, having the, uh, the both on best licensing practices. Uh, you can also find a, a text channel dedicated to the discussion in this both uh, under in Discord under Monday both. It's uh, the first one, at least on my screen. If you go in there, you will see that there are uh, lots of links that have been uh, published already. And, uh, um, and you can uh, have a discussion in there. Uh, Jan Grange is organizing this both. And so I will uh, just leave the stage to him and uh, his panelists and presenters. Jan, it's yours. Thank you, Francesco. So let me start by saying welcome to everyone. Oh, wow, my, uh, the sun is shining nicely on my shoulder, I see. Um, so I wanted to give a very few words of introduction on, on, on what we're going to do. Um, so we, the idea is that we will start with two short views on, on, on their best licensing practices from two organizations by Nuria and uh, Matthias on uh, well the, their respective institutions. Um, and then we will list, uh, uh, Thomas Jürgens will give a list of topics that is uh, 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 that, that we found from the survey and we can have a vote on what's more mostly uh, uh, attractive to the, to the crowd and we can start by uh, uh, the discussion from there. Um, as you can see on the shared screen by Utah right now, we have a website. Uh, where we put in all the material. We uh, dumped the link on Discord, so you can actually click it and you can see everything we will present probably already in advance if you really want to. Um, another thing on the survey, I just checked that we had 32 entries already on the survey. I think that this is far outnumbering what any of us expected, but I see that there are still many more participants to this session. We are planning to keep the survey open until the end of this session. So if you uh, uh, still want to, to basically uh, fill in the survey that would be nice so that we actually have a nice uh, statistic uh, also that we can show at the end of the session and we can take it on board for the proceedings and the overview slide that we will present on Thursday. Um, so for the discussion uh, will be uh, basically you can uh, of course use both the discord channel and the Q&A in this uh, uh, well in, in, in Zoom. We'll keep an eye on both. Uh, we'll probably we'll do our best to actually put all the discussion that happens in the Q&A also in Discord, because of course Discord has a history and the Zoom Q&A doesn't. So uh, if you ask your question on the Q&A, you see it appear on Discord, that is uh, uh, actually intentional. If you want to speak up during the, the open discussion, uh, you can uh, use your raise hand on Zoom and I'm sure you by now know how that works. So I wanted to give a very short overview of who our panelists are. Uh, so we have Thomas Jürgens, who is the chair of the Astron Open Source uh, Open Source Committee. Uh, so Thomas, uh, in terms of projects, is probably mostly involved in, in, in the LOVAR project. But again, as an open source committee, of which I am also a member, we, we well, talk about these topics at the Astron level. Uh, then we have uh, Jutta Schnabel, who is involved in the KM3Net project. Uh, one of the things she did that's also relevant here is she set up a, a well, I'll, I'll call it a licensing task force within the European Escape project, which is a collaboration between astro and particle physics uh, instruments. Uh, Matthias Fusling is also in that group, uh, who uh, he works uh, mostly in the CTA. Um, and we have Nuria Lorente. I'm pretty sure she doesn't need too much of an introduction either. Um, and since she's going to be the first speaker, uh, I'm sure she's, uh, uh, well, you all know her. <clears throat> so I don't want to spend much more time on this and let's get started. I guess with Nuria, you can unmute yourself. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Perfect. Excellent. Um, I'm Yuri Laurenti uh, from the AAO. Um, I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about 
um, how we at the AO over the years have been uh, dealing with the concept of, uh, of software licensing. It's great to come and discuss how we're going to do licensing and uh, how to choose a license and so on. Um, but I felt it was important for us to put into context how a, uh, I'm going to call us old, how an old organization um, deals with licensing and how th these things change over time. Um, so uh, the AAO started in uh, 1974 and we were the Anglo-Australian, oh, hang on, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen. Beg your pardon. Uh, too much excitement. There we are. Ah, as I was saying, um, we started off as a, uh, a statutory body set up by an act of parliament, um, the Anglo-Australian Observatory. So uh, an observatory set up by the UK and by Australia. Um, and at that point, our um, highest level of governance was the AAO board. And so as you can see here, the, um, the sorts of statements that we had in our software um, were to do with uh, this is our software, we own the copyright, um, and if you want to do something about it, you need to talk to the uh, Anglo-Australian Telescope Board to get their permission. Um, and then that changed slightly to, um, we give you permission to do things in a, on a non-commercial basis, but otherwise you still need to talk to us and get, uh, get permission from the board. Um, so this was until 2010, at which point um, we became part of the, uh, of the federal government of Australia, so part of the Department of Industry, well at the time, Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education. Um, so that's a, a somewhat different uh, setup. Um, a government body has a, uh, a legal department and uh, Tony Farrell here spent a large amount of time talking to the, uh, the legal department um, and coming up with a software copyright and licensing policy, um, which uh, we needed to follow. Um, and the broad prin principles of this were about intellectual property, um, also about sharing the, uh, the results of the software work that we do and also about liability so if you use our software it's on an is as is basis um we're happy to provide it but we don't um guarantee anything um and then in terms of the licensing itself uh, they came up with three uh, different levels of licensing so the default license which is uh very restrictive um you need permission from the aao in written form to do anything and no warranties whatsoever. Then the second level of, uh, of licensing um, is a permissive licensing based on, uh, on the MIT license. Um, so this was intended for uh, small software projects um, of uh, what the lawyers call limited intellectual value. We could argue about that for a while as to what that means. Um, and also the liability issue. So we would like to share things, but we want to minimize our, our liability. And you can see the, uh, the wording of the, of the license there. Um, and then the third type of um, license um, is the public domain license. So GPL and LGPL. And that was particularly pointed at uh, larger software packages, which had um, some significant intellectual value, and also about facilitating code sharing um, in both directions. Um, again, minimizing liability. So um, over the last, uh, well, the eight, nine years that we were part of the, uh, of the Department of Industry, um, this is what governed the, our, our licensing and copyright of software. Um, but of course, there is a, an ongoing issue here that new software that comes out during that time, um, it's obvious that you need to apply one of these licenses to it, but what happens with the earliest, earlier uh, software that was released under a different license? So that's, I think, a, an interesting um, point of discussion um, when we talk about licensing, what happens with licensing 
from institutes that uh, that go on for for many many years. Um, and then finally, where we are today is uh, we are now part of uh, Macquarie University, so we're now. Um, Australian Astronomical Optics, Macquarie University, still AAO. Um, and we have all this history of uh, software and uh, the various licensing, um, but we are under a different jurisdiction. So uh, licensing is, uh, I say it's currently in discussion. You will see that uh, we've been part of Macquarie University since 2018. Um, and this is another interesting point possibly um that licensing sometimes takes a very back seat um in the discussions we worry about lots of other things deadlines and milestones and so on um but licensing sometimes gets a push back to the side um so what uh, the licensing that is currently in discussion here is the three that i've just mentioned the restrictive license uh the mit type license and then gpl and lgpl and it is likely that going forward, um, our decisions on what license uh, to apply will be very much project based and dependent on our intended audience. Thank you. That's uh, me. I will hand back to Jan. Cool. Um, so uh, the next on the planning, let's just continue with Matthias Fusling, giving an overview of the CTA side, CTA side of things. Please, Matthias. Yes, hello. I also have um, two slides to share. Um, I will share also my screen. Um, So what I will just say a few words about this, uh, the license that um, we are trying to, uh, to, to um, establish for the CTA observatory. The CTA observatory is currently under construction. So we are a relatively new project um, when it comes to you know, entering the phase of uh, caring for the software licenses. And we are just establishing a general license policy within CTA. So in the past, one to two years, we were actually trying to establish our views on the different parts on and, and approaches, how you can do it. And so we have a bit of insight in the back and forth of the different approaches. Um, nevertheless, here I would like just to show you, share where we are. Yeah? So one of the key things uh, to keep in mind is that a licensing policy, especially for a large scale project as CTA, um, is probably influenced by the organizational structure that you have. Yeah? And in CTA, uh, most of the software will actually be developed as in-kind contributions by contributing institutions that are worldwide around uh, distributed. All of them have internally their own software license policies. So there is some, uh, also some approaches about culture that, that you have to meet there as well as bringing all the software together and being able as an organization, so the CTO Observatory is the central organization that will receive the software and then use it or further distribute it. Yeah. Um, then we have the CTA personnel that is directly be hired by CTO that uh, naturally will uh, write software under the license that Observatory will use. And we will also have industrial partners yeah, that contribute uh, sub, uh, either in, in the in-kind contributions or directly by CTO and, and, and to contribute tasks they are being subcontracted. So what we decided for is that the observatory is adopting an open software policy, um, which has a lot of benefits. If you are listed on this slide, um, I think they are more or less clear to everybody um, that the rules are clear once you have an open software policy license on how to transfer code from the in-kind contributors to the observatory. You allow an international collaboration you and you're able to incorporate and uh, use uh, wide open source libraries as part of that code yeah, because many are requesting that. Um, the code is made publicly available. Um, that is essentially fair for the effort of such a funded project, which is publicly funded, it gives back to the society, but it also allows to interact with the community 
And parts of our software actually also or will be driven also by the open source community, especially when it comes to the higher level science-based software, like, like the science analysis tools. We will have a lot of contributions there. Um, and then maybe a minor issue, but for the central organization that has to take care of, of keeping the software in place, um, it is important that a lot of tools exist for organizations for open source software that, that adopt an open source, source software policy that you can use yeah, to manage your code. And that has a cost factor, actually. Yeah, so these are all things that drove us towards the open policy. Then which one we have chosen? So we also um, went for the bespoke software. So the software that is actually written specifically for CTO for an MIT-based or type license policy, a BSD3 clause. Um, we allow for departure from this license uh, when it's justified. So it can still happen that certain software has to be made more um, close, especially when it uses other software that is also closed. But that has to be done on a case-by-case on -case basis. Yeah, then we will have derived software, typically a mixture of licenses um, that uh, we then put together. But this permissive license on the BSD3 clause allows to use these different kinds of license and put them together in a more easy way. Um, and then off-the-shelf software is naturally out of, outside of our control. So also there on, on a case-by-case -case basis, we have to deal with effect on incorporating that in our software stack, either by um, purchasing it directly or uh, making it useful yeah, in another way. Then we have the Creative Commons attribution that we will always accept for documentation and images. We're not including here, and I'm not discussing any data, li any licenses to data products, which is a whole own topic. Yeah. Then for each software, we will have a copyright notice um, that is attached to the software. It is updated, and just the starting of that is put here. It is very similar to what Nuria showed uh, just a moment ago. And just lastly mentioning, it's not written here, that with any in-kind contributor, then we will uh, establish a contributors license agreement um, that should uh, and everybody should adhere to once contributing to the CTA software. So that will also mean to the larger community um, that that will hopefully uh, contribute to CTA software. Yeah, this is where we are, and um, just wanted to give this quick overview. Thanks. Yes. <clears throat> Oh, let me turn on my camera as well. Um, so I think next we will have a uh, Thomas giving us some overview of the uh, what do you call it the results of the um, ah, inquiry we sent out. I'm sure that Thomas has a better word for this than me. Please take the floor. Give me a second. Uh, I'm about to share my screen. Share screen. You sound a bit softly. I'm not sure if you can speak I, louder am or have you. Too, am I mumbling too much? Well, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Let's put it back. Hello. Test, test, test. Yes. Yeah, okay. That should have been worked out yesterday. I'm sorry for that. How's it now? Better? Much better. Much better. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, it should have been worked out yesterday, but obviously I didn't. So, good morning, everybody. Um, as you know by now, we've uh, created a small survey um, on the subject of, uh, well, <laughs> licensing your software. Um, it's not a very interesting topic, so I'm very surprised that we have so many uh, people in the attendance now. Um, let's get right to the survey, because obviously we have now 44 responses. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So, first question was, uh, what is the default license of your institute collaboration with respect uh, to software licenses? And uh, we received so far 44 responses. Um, we see here a head-to-head -head race. Um, I don't know. And uh, permissive license, which is uh, what we already saw um, so far, that we have uh, the CTA, for instance, with the permissive license. Um, so keep your responses coming in. Um, we'll need them later for our um, conference notes. Um, then the second question we asked you is, is the license strongly enforced by the institute or collaboration you're part of? Well, that's kind of a mixed bag of a question, isn't it? Because the problem is always, how do you actually enforce a license, right? Um, so the replies, uh, we expected them uh, to be in, in this bracket here. No, 65.9%, yes. Um, I answered for, I replied for Astron, yes, um, because we have an open source policy that we uh, presented last year at the uh, ADAS 2019. Um, so I'm, my answer is a bit biased because, well, being the chair of Astron's open source committee, I like to enforce the license. So, but obviously I don't really have any leverage uh, to really do it. The next question we posed was, uh, what license do you use for your work-related software? So um, it can be that uh, a license is uh, chosen for you by your institute's uh, policy, for instance, but you're not aware of it or you don't actually follow to apply it. So the majority of replies here is again, Oops, sorry, what was that? The majority of replies here again is 44.4% uh, uh, actually do apply a license uh, that is permissive. The next runner up is copyleft, GPL, and uh, buddies, 22.2%. So it's kind of almost half of uh, the people who have replied so far that uh, apply to work related software a permissive license. Then Thomas, we can I interrupt asked... you? Yes, Somebody please. has yes. asked whether you could possibly uh, widen the screen so that the, res the response page fits one question at a time. I think people are finding it difficult to see. Uh, widen the screen. My sc I have everything is full screen here. Ah, okay. It's, Never mind. It's, it's the it's if the, the answer Google is no, thing, that's fine. I'm afraid. It's the, no wait worries. a second. Wait a second preview let's try this here no it's the same thing it's it's the google thing you do control everything plus is full screen zoom in, zoom in. that's like control plus ah, somebody or saying or control plus, plus. yay yes, control plus there you, go. Mm. there you go yeah it's the old people who don't know the computers sorry sorry for that so um where were we yeah let's let's quickly go through this again um, so here we had uh, the first question, what is the default license for institute collaboration with respect to software licenses? It's a head-to-head -head race. Uh, I don't know. Well, that's why you're here, obviously. And uh, others are actually applying a permissive license. Uh, second question we posed was, uh, is the license strongly enforced by the institute of collaboration you're part of? Uh, the majority says no. Well, we expected it more or less because uh, uh, the question is, how can you actually enforce uh, the application of a license or enforce a license at all? Then the third question we asked was, what license do you use for your work-related software? And uh, we have here the, a strong lead with uh, per permissive licenses, 43.5%. Uh, and uh, for close, well, half of the percentage only of the leader has copy left GPL. So, and the rest is almost evenly distributed. So then we continued and asked you, okay, what are the most pressing points that you, you would like to be uh, discussed in this, in this boff, right? Regarding a 
licensing scientific software. So we have already a good amount of uh, very, very valuable feedback. Uh, obviously, some, some very clear things that everybody would follow. Obviously, some more intricate things like, uh, okay, uh, copyright assignment and compliance with external licenses, right? In large part, the point you're making of making our soft, damn it. <laughs> of making the, yep. Yeah. Of, of, make, of making our software open source is to solicit contribution from the community. And that's a very, very good point, right? Uh, it's it's uh, as earlier said today, this morning, it is that we wanna, we want contributions, right? Uh, that's why we put out uh, our software out in the open. That could be one of the reasons to apply an open source license. So there are very valuable uh, replies here. I've taken up a couple of them before actually we started the BOF and included them that uh, we can later discuss uh, a handful of topics for which we have prepared um, a poll um, that we ask you to actually, uh, well, perform now because we have uh, limited time, obviously. Let me switch over here to Mentimeter. Um, can somebody of us please share the link if not done already? Um, I would take over the screen if that's okay, because the uh, link is yes. then visible um, when I display yes. it. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> So um, as Thomas just said, we have um, a list of the most important topics that we picked, unfortunately, only until um, Sunday evening. So if you just added your um, suggestions, um, there are two ways to actually still get them in here. First of all, um, first of all, you can um, uh, put them into the chat. We will, of course, um, in, in the Discord channel, we will pick that up. On the other hand, if you go, as it says here, either through our webpage or directly to menti.com and you enter this code, you can actually get to the survey. Um, and there is two parts to the survey. The first one is uh, it asks you to rank the questions. If you either don't want to rank that or you're done quite quickly, you can also add a different topic here. And um, once you've ranked the first one, um, the first survey, you get to a second page and here you can also add additional topics and questions. So um, in order not to be dictatorial and say what we are doing now, please, so please go to this web page um, and enter your preferences. So we have a order um, in which to approach uh, the different topics that you mentioned. Thanks. Now we'll give you some time to vote. <laughs> so there will be some awkward silence, I guess. But yeah, and as I said, you can also get here through our Discord channel and through the web page. The web page, by the way, might be useful for you um, because you will find um, also, um, as you as you saw, you had the option to dump useful links. For example, we will collect them there. Um, and uh, yeah, we will collect uh, the links there, for example, you will get all the results there, et cetera. And also if we are using further Mentimeter polls, um, the direct link actually to the polls can also be found there. So as you can Just for convenience, I'll post the link in our BOF. and the code. So maybe while waiting, actually there seem to already be some questions in the Discord channel, which I think are mostly based on the talks that you guys have given. Yes, there's uh, Andreas. Uh, 
he's he's uh, actually made a good good comment there. Um, he says, I guess a lot of people who are involved in large projects have to juggle with a number of licenses, guide or uh, um, maybe even conflicting guidelines. So, yes, that's a very good point, Andreas, and uh, that is uh, part of, I think, item number two that we're where we want to actually tackle that. So to try and create the real boff feeling, I will ask all the panelists to turn on their camera so that we can have sort of this small gallery of panelists somewhere. That would probably also mean that some people need to be unspotlighted. Um, I'm not sure actually how it works if we all get spotlights, but you know. Let's try to, to, to create the real boff feeling also. Yeah, I think all our cameras are on. So there's a, another question coming in. Um, how do you go when you have different style licenses? For example, you want to use both GPL and a BSD3 library? Well, that's actually also a very good question. And I believe we will answer that question in topic number, or we would, we would discuss this topic in number three. What if licenses and projects collaborations do not mix? Well, or they mix, but they don't mix nicely, right? Um, another comment we have is um, a question. Does anybody have experience with the use of contributor license agreement to manage contributions in your organization? That would be a question we could discuss uh, in... Hmm. Huh, where? I think we omitted a subject, perhaps number five, a different topic. Yeah, I think that would come to a different topic. And I know that we have backup slides on that. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> sounds like the BOF uh, panel is very well prepared. <laughs> well, we happen to have two collaborations in the BOF, right? So <laughs> people from collaborations. Ooh, actually. So shall we just try and, and, and go and pick up the first point? Because I see we got 49 responses and there are 80 attendees. So we are far over half of the people. So let's pick up with the first question. How do how to how do to choose a slide? Now we probably do have some backup material on that, but maybe if people want to concretely ask the question or or have any comments, please either raise your hand or put put in this quarter in the QA. Yeah, let me just present a, a slide I prepared with a couple of topics that came up during the survey. Share screen, we go here, share, present. All right, um, is that the right, is that the right one? I think Maybe yes, good reasons. Good reasons for open source for open licenses. Uh, so three topics uh, so far until this morning came up. Um, licensing is is very often uh, an afterthought, but cannot be changed without legal risk if external people already contributed and uh, copyright hasn't been transferred. That's uh, very true. Or how can we convince our superiors to use open licenses? Yes, that is something I would believe 50 per, is itching 50% of the participants right now here. Um, importance of licensing and increasing percentage of codes that have a license. Yes, that's also true because uh, otherwise everything is just up for grabs, isn't it? Yeah, I just wanted to give you uh, some uh, ideas uh, what we could discuss there. Okay, so I'm not sure if there are 
any discussion on this on Discord? So perhaps I can add again um, from what we already collected. Um, yes. And please keep keep the information or the ideas of um, where you find good uh, sources coming, because I think the one thing that is sure about license there is no no defined path how to actually do it because it's uh, always a question between the different um, organizations between the different options and so on. Um, so just to show I hope um, Jan you being so close to the camera doesn't mean that I'm too too low in the voice. No, it just means my eyes are too bad to actually read the discord correctly. <laughs> okay, so um, if you go to our web page, for example, we have here the useful links. Um, and uh, for example, there are good overview pages of actually the different open source licenses um, and their different, um, their different um, aspects or clauses. So I think one of the questions I saw earlier was also, are there licenses that aren't five or six pages long and you actually don't read through them? Well, there are. Something like the MIT license is actually quite short. Um, they become more complex because they um, include different legal aspects, um, like um, the patent retaliation clauses, for example, um, or um, uh, copyleft um, clauses where it's about uh, where licenses don't mix with other licenses that um, uh, are not open. So, um, for example, as a first guideline, look at one of these things. Um, or um, what we also got is uh, things like the EU licensing assistant, um, where you have a long, unfortunately a long um, guideline of clicking yourself through the different licenses. If you are choosing from a spot where nothing else tells you what, where you, you take your license from, what is usually not the case because you're employed somewhere and some uh, this organization probably has um, a uh, policy of, uh, for this, you are even in a collaboration where the collaboration doesn't mix uh, anymore with your institute and so on. So where that becomes messy. Um, so uh, that is of course then the other question. Do you actually have um, already a guideline um, set up? So um, that's on, on what you have on the part of how to choose. Um, so, um, on, I'm not sure actually which, um, but what I can show you in the backup slides, I, I can give you here an overview over the most popular licenses you already saw um, in, the, in the survey. These are the open licenses um, or the most commonly used. And of course, if you use a standard license, it's always much easier because it's known, um, it is easy to see if things do mix with other licenses or not, because there are several um, comparisons and, and pages on that. Um, and of course, then you can start arguing, do you want a copyleft clause or not? And of course, copyleft clause is always dangerous, let's say, because they limit the interoperability. Um, on the other hand, uh, that might be your if you, if that is your your way to choose. Um, you can um, of course uh, set this up, but have to be aware of different um, aspects there. So I mean, on the one hand, you're enforcing open source licenses. On the other hand, um, relicensing, for example, can become more difficult. Um, and as I said, interoperability might become more difficult. Um, so I think there comes a philosophy question here between the copyleft and the permissive. Yeah, I think that's most on my from my side for that. Great. So I actually see on this quarter is probably two questions already that relate to this. The question by Adriana and the comment by Andreas, which both I think are valid. So shall I just read them out here? Although maybe Adriana could probably just ask the questions herself because it's a very long question. Um, so you may want to raise your hand so that I can give you the 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 the, the, the floor. So I think maybe while at it, I think the, the the comment of the Andreas is that there are the the, the fair fair guidelines that we need to adhere to, which obviously are a 
I would argue are an argument for an open license at least. And one could argue that maybe reusability is actually a, a, may require a, a actually a, a, a permissive license. Data licensing is another interesting one. Well, <laughs> Andreas keeps uh, mentioning the, 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 the right terms. Um, yeah, so maybe a few more thoughts about how to choose a license. Yeah, so uh, Jutta gave um, just now a good overview of um, resources that you can find on the web yeah? um, that might help you to, to find or to choose to discuss different versions of licenses. What has helped us in CTA Observatory was actually to establish active discussions with current players in the field. Yeah, the field is moving, especially in the science world and in the uh, world of these, um, let's say, science-related uh, installations and organizations um, that are all thinking about software licenses and actually uh, discussing with uh, in, in forums. And this is why actually we came uh, here to create this BOF, to create active discussions, which is now a bit difficult in the virtual world, as, as we realize. But nevertheless, discussions have helped us to adopt uh, best practices. And for example, in CTA, we had a lot of influence on what we chose uh, while discussing with colleagues from SKA, with ESO and with Astron, for example. And that helped us to choose the right license. I think the what is mentioned in the chat, the FAIR guidelines, is actually something that tries to establish this kind of forum and guidelines so that uh, large-scale inst installations can, can pick that up. So whenever you approach this, the best practice should always be to, to get in touch with whomever is ongoing, uh, because everybody is caring for the same questions. Um, the second thing that I would like to mention for, and pick up from the chat, uh, the question on different licenses. So in CTA, we have discussed and weigh these different kind of licenses. So uh, to have the fully copyleft license felt a bit too extreme for us in all the software uh, stacks, but for the higher level science community, uh, so those things that are, for example, more like the science tools, so the high level science analysis tools, they can become likely uh, copy, fully copyleft um, driven software tools, yeah, because they are there you have rather the questions to into to establish and and collaborate with the, with a large community that you want to be as large as possible so no restrictions yeah, attached otherwise for the let's say the core software stack we are going more for for the permissive license because there we have more um, to engage with uh, dedicated institutions from in-kind contributors which is which is a bit different than the, this large community and uh, why, for example, we chose um, the MIT-based BSD clause, for example, compared to Apache uh, license was just that, um, as is shown in the backup slides, um, the, let's say the text is much shorter in the MIT type, uh, so much easier to, to deal with, with the legal departments of the in-kind contributors that also have to read it, etc. And that Apache's most, uh, I think, benefit is especially for for patents. But we hope, or we we do not count that that we will have to deal with patents in our software. Yeah, that might have been a di bit different for Astron that adopted actually the Apache approach. And maybe Jan can say a few words how you established open source policy within Astron. Yeah, which is which relates to this question. Sure, I can. <laughs> I was also looking at Thomas, but I think how we established that. Um, I could, of course, be very short and say, you should have seen my talk last year at ADAT, but that's probably not the best way of doing it. Um, <laughs> so, well, we, it, it took some, some time to, 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 to go to, to here. And I think the, 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 so we wanted to, uh, basically, we, we have a, a, our own software stack and develop our own software. and. So what we're trying to do is actually we're trying to follow the um, the government policy, the NWO, which is the, the funding agency that we are also a, a part of. Or I mean, it's both a funding agency and a institute organization. 
And they have an open data policy. And I think that also, also links a bit to how do you look at this from the FAIR perspective. We basically took the, the, the comments they made on research output data and tr translated that to software. And then you end up wanting to have a permissive license. <clears throat> um, and then we made a very pragmatic choice for the Apache license, mostly because, well, I think, I, I guess one of the arguments was that, that you know, we, we saw institutes around us doing that as well. And, and I mean, it's all, it's, especially if it's within the same organization, it's never hard, uh, bad to do so. But I think the other argument is that it uh, actually supports us to have a, uh, a notes file in the repository that's protected by the license and in which we can ask people to cite our code. And of course, that is something that we are not really uh, 100% falling under the, 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 the point of licensing, but that's kind of the, the well, that, that I think that's our rationale behind the choice we've made. And then we added some extra, um, um, how do you call it, rule, rule, rules, or how do you call that in a policy? And, and again, how enforceable is it? But uh, we, 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 we've added a few comments for people to, to actually make their code citable and, and add that to the repository and I see that Thomas is unmuted so he's probably going to add something. Yes, yes there's uh, the first raised hand. Uh, can you give the floor to Ole Streicher please? You should be allowed to talk Ole. Oh right, <laughs> I just uh, have to well, look uh, how, the, how that works. Uh, well I, I have a few comments. The first comment is that this buff is rather high level in the moment because but I, what I see as well, being the, well, one of the packages for Debian uh, is that well, many people don't think so much about software at all. And if, if everyone would have the kind of um, a license manager or something like that, or would really think about it, my life would be much easier. Uh, the other thing is a bit, well, there, there are a few comments on which are slower. One, one is, for example, uh, don't use, uh, well, don't create your own license. That's a very common uh, mistake people do because they think they want to put their, their own stuff there. One, for example, is uh, about in, uh, enforcing people to cite the software, something like that. If you, uh, if you write something like, if uh, I don't, uh, if you use my software, you need to cite it. Uh, in your paper or something like that. That's something which makes the software essentially non-free. Um, another is that you try to limit the use of it, not, not only of commercial versus non-commercial, but also even if you write something like that, software should be used only for good, not for bad. It's a, it's a restriction on the license, if you write it in the license. Instead, you should make outside of the license or make it clear that you have some wishes which are not, uh, which are not there. And it, that makes really my life difficult because in Debian we can't accept such software. And I, even if I would try it, I get it rejected from our FTP masters. Um, the third is to encourage people to use permissive licenses. Uh, that is well, not GPL mainly. And the main reason for that is interoperability. Once you start to use uh, GPL, then Everyone else needs to use that. And there's the example from AstroPy where they start, they wanted to have some heel picks there, but AstroPy itself is a BSD license. Um, and uh, uh, the heel picks, the original heel picks software is GPL. And so they couldn't use that because that would make the whole uh, AstroPy package GPL, which is a license change. But independent of people want that, just, it's just impossible because uh, AstroPy has something like uh, 300 contributors now, and they all would have to agree on that. Uh, and that's why I would really ask please use uh, established permissive license whenever possible and have a good reason not to do that only. Okay, that's, I think, all for the moment. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Ole. <laughs> um, I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, I uh, saw James Tocknell in the uh, 
chat saying something about he having a preferring GPL, and I think it's never bad to now that we've had someone giving a very nice uh, sort of argumentation of for using permissive licenses. It would be nice if uh, if you could maybe comment a bit on that. But for that, you should re raise your hand in Zoom, I think, so that I can click on you and unmute you. Perhaps he's on uh, YouTube. He's from YouTube. All these people be ah, Mark. We can always okay. Mark. Shall I give the Mark catching us now? Yep. Mark, you you can speak. So since you solicited some input on that subject, the reason people sometimes argue that you should GPL your code and not use a more permissive license. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Is uh, that. Um, it, it sort of um, encourages collaboration or, or contributing your software back um, because uh, you can't share uh, your software with others without sharing it with everybody. So if somebody takes your software, makes modifications, um, then if they republish it, um, distribute any binaries of the code, they also have to distribute the source code. Um, whereas uh, a more permissive license, such as the BSD license, allows you to take the software, incorporate it in, 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 a, in a commercial product and never give the source code back. Um, of course, um, the GPL doesn't really keep people from um, from taking your software, making their own modifications and never sharing it. Um, and I think actually in the scientific community, especially on the, on the side of the scientists, that's actually a, a much more likely scenario than somebody taking the software and turning it into, into a, a commercial product and never giving anything back. So that, that were my, my thoughts about the difference between the, the permissive licenses and the, and the more uh, uh, restricted licenses like the GPL. So Mark, uh, you, you mentioned now uh, two things, if I'm not mistaken, the idealistic reason to choose a license and the real world reason to choose a license. And uh, I think that is the core of uh, the item we, we try to start discussing now. That is uh, us being humans, us being humans that try to be good and to share our knowledge because we are in the knowledge uh, detecting and knowledge creating a, a part of, of uh, work that uh, we want to contribute back, right? And uh, we want to we want others to, to share our ideas. So we put our software under GPL because the text of the GPL strongly encourages uh, to actually give back, right? And then we have on the other side, the real world licenses, I would call them. That is uh, in real life, uh, people take my source code and uh, they do whatever they want to do with it anyway, in any case. I have no control over uh, they returning anything back to me, back to my project, back to anybody. They, they, they do whatever they want to do with it in any case. So I think this is the core to me, at least, uh, that, that the choosing of a license makes it, uh, makes it a complicated business. I probably agree with that. My microphone still open? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I, I, I was arguing that yes, that that may be the case, but in practice, um, that consideration for at least some types of scientific software, the the, the the software that lives in the user domain, actually doesn't make a make a huge difference. I think, um, and and on the institutional side, I think there is with all these fair principles, there is a there's a good basis of, of sharing software anyway. Um, so I don't think you need 
what I was arguing is I think I don't think you need to GPL software uh, your software to enforce um, people contributing things back. I don't think it changes has a huge impact on the, on that. There may be other reasons why you why you might prefer GPL, of course. So I see it actually both Andreas and Tamayana uh, raised their hand. Uh, Andreas was first, so I will give you the floor first. You can now talk. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good. Um, so just a, just a comment on on uh, the type of software we are uh, actually dealing with. So I guess uh, the kind of random uh, PhD student writing a piece of software is not really the, the, the big issue in any of these. Many of those don't care at all about uh, software licensing uh, for most of their um, work, which I think is actually fairly uh, good in a way. Um, it only comes in when uh, some of this software gets uh, so interesting or so uh, much used that uh, the whole thing is actually has to be taken over by, by an institution. And that brings me to another uh, block of software, which is actually provided and written by institutions rather than individuals. Of course, there are the individuals behind, but uh, the licensing is usually coming from institutions and also kept by institutions um, and that that is a quite different beast um, and uh, um, I think we have to focus on the second part not the first one uh, the first one is a is a, a can of worms we don't want to open even um, I would like to hear a bit of uh, response to that part It's a lot of closed mics on our side. Um, <laughs> so you're, um, that's a good question. Uh, brother, Thomas is already. Yeah, I think I think this is a birds of a feather and we should others uh, allow to answer and comment. So Tamo Yan. Tamo Yan will, I will allow Tamo to talk right now. You can unmute. Sorry, what should I talk about? I don't know, you raise your hand. Okay, but I should not respond to Andreas here. No, no never, never do that. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> you can if you want to. No, no, I'll just ignore Andreas. <laughs> So um, the, 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 a question I raised ju just raised on the Discord, but it's probably better to raise it in the session itself. Um, it's quite hard to relicense software, and most of us are working on old software, or I'm working on a lot of old software like Casacore, which has uh, at least 30 years of Git history. Um, that's been licensed under uh, GPL. I think it would be nice to uh, uh, relicense it as Apache or BSD. Um, but relicensing software seems to be a can of worms. So um, when I ask someone, what, what should we do? How, how can we relicense it? Then people say, as, uh, uh, as Ole just did on, the, on Discord, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I think you'd have to ask all the 30 years of contributors or all the institutes. Um, I think that's true too. And also, I think it's quite hard to find a lawyer who, who will actually uh, uh, give you a, a plan on how to exactly relicense all software. So if anyone has experience with that uh, or hints, I'd, uh, I'd like to hear that. I can see there uh, a, such a, a theme for next year's ADAS uh, Birds of a Feather session on uh, software licensing. Uh, how to find the right lawyer for relicensing your old source code. Yeah. So actually within Astron, we have this great uh, uh, open so uh, source policy, but in the policy is explicitly, this only holds for new software, old software uh, would be nice, but we're not going to touch that. That was a way of us saying, this is a huge can of worms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As long as we as long as we don't have a decent open source lawyer who actually knows how science works. 
I think I would like to add a bit yes. to that. Um, Great. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I think um, the first thing everybody always says um, when they're talking about the topic is I'm not a lawyer. So I'm not a lawyer. Um, and uh, but of course, we had this discussion as well. And perhaps coming back just very, very quickly to one of the comments we had before, this is a very high level session. So it, when we started in came 3 to think about copyrights, it's the same thing. Nobody actually knows what the thing is about. And um, so I have a very short, very, very short, short law introduction here, um, just to make sure that we un understand what we're talking about. So um, copyright is basically something that is invoked because somebody makes something, a creative act. And in order to protect what comes out of that, we have copyright. So we have this copyright assigned to the product and you need always a contract or general law to say how people, other people can use the product from this creative act. So if you have a software where 200 people con contributed something to it, we have 200 people having this creative act contributing and all of these have a certain part of copyright. So actually you would have to go back to all of them and ask them um, if you're allowed to change the copyright on that. Um, and, but this, and the copyright is always enforced in a certain state. So every country has their own copyright law. Of course, we have something like uh, worldwide treaties and uh, for example, in the EU directives that govern a common approach to copyright. But in the end, it always comes down to a civil lawsuit if you have problems with a copyright. So somebody takes you to court in some country and that copyright law of that country applies. So there is no general copyright law basically um, on a worldwide scale. So it's always in the fine, fine print um, and it's governed by contracts. So if you have an, assign, uh, an employment contract, a two-party contract, for example, with a company which is providing software, or if you're in a, um, in a uh, collaboration where you have uh, clauses in your collaboration contract on uh, intellectual property, right? It's always boils down to that. And relicensing actually comes in from this very first point. So you have to ask all of them. We had a presentation in a workshop just three months back about um, where we had a presenter who gave um, examples on how to relicense. So what you can do there in the example, and I'm sorry, I don't recall all of it was, um, of course you can, if you have a big part of uh, software, you can put up notices that you're planning to changing um, the software. So, and distribute that through all the channels that are available to you. So you give people, for example, uh, uh, more or less the possibility to, um, uh, to protest against that. Um, and let's say in, in law, usually you have this kind of due diligence thing. So it always, always boils, boils down to if anybody really complains and brings you to court. If you show in a context that you have really in, in, in a well-informed way and so on, do all possible that you can, um, at some point it's also up to reason to say, okay, now we can actually, nobody has complained in a year. Um, we have reached all the, the contributors in all the ways that we could. Um, if there's no complaint up to, to that point, uh, we can go ahead and relicense it. But this is of course never 100%. Sure. This is, I think, the, the thing I, I, I could say what I remember also from, from this discussion there. Um, and just here, a few slides shortly to say which different parts that actually come in when it comes to, to choosing your license and to who is actually the holder of a copyright. Um, so, yeah, just to say very quickly, yes, it's complex. And there's, I think there's never a 100% answer. Yeah. If you end up again. <laughs> Andreas, Mark, and Tamo, and I think that they did it in that order. So let's start with Andreas. You should if I can unmute, yeah, if I can <laughs> unmute, but I, I think I could. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, uh, one, one thing, there is a quite distinct difference between copyright and license. Uh, license is, uh, copyright is essentially automatic, uh, a license is not. Um, and uh, so, so you can choose a license, uh, a copyright is always there, no matter whether you, you cho chose one or not. 
Um, and that can gives just, a, a, yep, sure. Can I just add to that? This is a contract. I mean, sorry, that's, I didn't make that clear before. A license is nothing but a contract between the, the creators and the end users um, where it states, uh, so any end user where it states how you are allowed to, to use the product. So it is one of these different, it's, it's one contractual um, version of saying how somebody can use it. So sorry for not making that clear. So copyright is always there. License is the contract between you and the end user saying um, how it is possible to use and reuse the software in this case. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, uh, so so I think that, that should be clear as well. So if, if you don't have a license attached to your software or data or whatever you do, uh, there's still a copyright. And uh, transferring a license to another thing is actually something else than transferring copyright to some other, some other persons or institutions. That's not the same. Um, yes, and may I add, um, there are countries where it's not possible to basically waive your copyright. So basically most European countries don't allow you to waive copyright. So a license is just telling people, yes, you can reuse. And there are some um, in the American system, I think it's possible to say, yes, we put something in the public domain. So the user basically gives up all their their, let's say, uh, their rights to this product and says, just, I can't do anything with it anymore. Everybody can use it for, and uh, yeah. Um, that's not possible in a lot of legal, uh, of legal environments, especially in Europe, for example. So a license mm -hmm. is really just governing how people can use it. And if you don't put a license, nobody, officially nobody can use it. So if your software doesn't carry a license, um, that would legally mean um, you are not allowed to take any code snippets, for example, from there and to use it in your own code because there's no license on it. It is um, protected by copyright. Yeah, and that, that I think is, is a good uh, reason why you should always have a license in, in the software. Yeah. But uh, on the other side, of course, there, there's lots of restrictions people are, well, restrictions. Um, they don't have the time or don't want to even think about it. And that's mostly uh, true for scientists working on their piece of data, more or less, and write a bit of software around it. I will, in light of time, uh, 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 try to, to, to handle the other raised hands as well. Andreas, if you're okay with that. Oh, if you're not, you already have been disabled now. Oh, um, oh he still has his hands up, hand up though. But I will go to Mark. In the meantime, I, I just wanted to, to put in a random comment and see if anybody will take the bait here. I know there are some places where they actually use proprietary license on their code. And I would be very curious to hear from someone, you know, if they would be willing to defend that choice. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, you know, if anybody takes this bait, I'd be very happy. Mark, you are permitted. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to shortly uh, react on, on Jutta. Um, also about the, the conference that we were at about relicensing. Um, I think it's very unwise to just put a message on, say, a mailing list, say, we plan to, uh, to relicense, please react if you don't agree. Uh, you have to do a, a little bit more to that to then guarantee due diligence. Uh, for example, if you have e email addresses of the individual authors, I think you have to contact them and can only decide to relicense if if you 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 can't actually uh, actively contact them it, it can't be something passive so i think the conclusion is don't relicense if you if you can avoid it because otherwise your only option is is to throw out the bits of code that those people have written and and rewrite those bits of the software which is Yes, which is what what's happened in in various uh, cases. A, a prime example is the OpenSSL library, where mm -hmm. some people did indicate that they didn't agree with the license change, and they have rewritten, uh, had to ha rewrite some of the parts of the library, and able to relicense it under a new license. Yes. Um. Okay. I will uh, give Tamo the floor first and then 
try to find out which button to push. You can talk, Tama. Yes, I can, and I will. Um, so responding to Mark again, I disagree. Uh, many authors of, in this case, Casa Core were paid by an institution to contribute. So if the institution now uh, agrees to relicense, I think that will be a way to avoid contacting people who have actually passed away. Um, uh, there is, of course, the issue that people are contributing from the open source side. Um, and I had a, um, uh, so just uh, make a pull request on GitHub. And I had an interesting experience uh, some months ago. Uh, the Dutch government is making a COVID-19 app, a warning app, and that's open source and on GitHub. And I thought, hey, I, I'll just make a pull request before, because I find it, found a typo on their website. I made a pull request and then I had to, th there is something like a claassistant.io, which integrates with GitHub, probably GitLab or whatever, that uh, makes you uh, sign a contributor license agreement before you can actually uh, make the pull request. Or that, that's just one of the, those GitHub actions. So there is such a thing as a contributor license agreement. I, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, in view of... Uh, uh, licensing discussions, it may be nice to uh, have a look at that. It was new, new for me, at least. I decided not to take away talking permission from Mark yet, because I thought he would probably want to reply on that. And I see his hand raised. So, so, so that's an alternative solution. Um, you can make people sign a piece of paper, or a, a virtual piece of paper, that say that they're OK with uh, a certain set of con conditions, basically enter a contract with you. Um, and if you put in that contract um, that uh, they assign, they allow them to relicense your contribution, then you're fine as well. But of course, you have to do this beforehand at making people sign a piece of paper uh, with scary lawyer language. Um, is uh, a barrier for people to actually contribute to your project. And it is, it is a hassle to, to keep the bookkeeping uh, of all those, uh, those pieces of paper. And those piece of pieces of paper would be called uh, a contributor license agreement. Yeah, the, for the hassle, there's just a plugin and an app now, nowadays. Everybody always signs everything on the internet, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe just adding to this discussion um, for uh, just for the case of CTA. So we have chosen to go towards also using a contributor license agreement. So we have that. It's about half a page of text uh, that you should uh, sign, that every individual should sign in, in top of being part of institutions that deliver software. But currently, this would be, let's say, the default also for all software, so also for the high-level science software, so the science tools. And we actually are, are still wondering if signing such a uh, contributor license agreement also within a larger community, which is not, for example, a paid institution as part of an in-kind contributor, would make uh, would set a bar, a threshold that uh, actually de demotivates people to contribute. Yeah? So this we don't want. So then we would rather not have a contributor license agreement, but then we might not know, you know how to handle the, the licenses uh, in, in, a, in a correct way. Um, so indeed, um, this is an, for us, it's an open question. What, what is the best way? Yeah. I see a shared screen and the, and the hand. Oh dear, I was just thinking maybe we should actually go on to the next topic just to, to have some other alternative discussion but i see so many hands up well that, that is just for uh for information purposes so maybe we have we we let mark make a comment and then i see that alice is alice is doubting whether she should raise her hand or not i think but <laughs> so let, let me start by that is you are get, getting very vulnerable on this side mark sorry I, you said your sounds disappeared, basically. OK. Is it better now? But now you're much better. OK. Um, basically, uh, if I work for a university or an institute and I sign a legal, uh, a, a CLA, which is a legal document, 
I probably don't have the authority to do so. So I should in that case, probably contact the legal apartment and get permission before uh, signing that document. How many people do you think would do that? Um, none, because most of us don't have a legal department that we can ask. That's the problem. Okay, <laughs> that was a clear answer, I guess. Alice has uh, asked a question on the Q&A to Yuta. Are the slides available to the uh, wider community outside of ADAS? Uh, that's the unmute. Uh, yes, they are. Um, this is a Git project. So all the uh, links we are gathering and so on are on a Git project, uh, the one that is linked in the chat channel. Um, that's an open project. So um, you can uh, have a look at the slides there as well and um, all the links that we gather and so on. And I'm sure they're licensed under an open license. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I see a lot of discussion in the Discord uh, happening, but I have a hard time trying to follow that and follow what people are saying over here. So I was thinking... Should we maybe move on to the second uh, that was, topic? <laughs> you are exactly filling in what I was going to say, Nuria. Thank you. So Jutta, you probably have an overview of the topics. I'm not sure if anything changed during the discussion in terms of ordering because that's the great thing of live polls, right? While Jutta is pulling that up, uh, can I just summarize what we found out? There will be there's no, uh, there's, there's no golden path. There's no the, the, the straight and right way to, to find your, your license for your project, for your collaboration, for your source code. It's a really complicated matter. And uh, that is why we are here. Right, uh, so let's keep that discussion uh, uh, continuing because I believe uh, my panelists agree with me. Yes. The license you should choose needs to be um, decided on, on a case by case base. And you need to. There's no golden rule. No. And I think you may need to keep in mind the, the long term, I think, is also one point that I got out of the relicensing discussion. Uh, I, I think part of this actually matches in very nicely to the what if licenses and project collaborations do not mix. Um. Yes, uh, for the sake of, of saving time, um, that uh, fits very nicely because the question came up uh, in the Discord mm -hmm. channel, is, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So let's say we're using, uh, we're applying Apache license at Astron and we want to use some GPL source code. Mm -hmm. So what the heck are we supposed to do then, right? Uh, like uh, Mark said, uh, rewrite the the code that that we're using that came with a GPL license attached and uh, do a clean room uh, re-implementation of it. But yeah, I don't know. What should we do? What are the solutions? And here um, I already prepared a slide. If you want, go to this Mentimeter and uh, you can actually already type in your answers here so we can have them displayed also in a easily uh, readable way. I was saying great, but I was muted. And Ola already wants to comment on this, so I will allow Ola to talk. You can talk. Yeah, sorry, um, uh, I have to, always have to click. Oh, sorry. Ah, I did something stupid, Ola. Uh, wait. Oh, that's sorry. Sorry, Ola. I, I, I was trying to remove oh. the talking permissions from the other two and accidentally I, I removed them from you. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, do, do you hear me? Hopefully. Um, uh, I think the, the best way to do there is to discuss that with the people which have the different license. And so if, if you get some code from somewhere and that has the wrong license for you, then you should just ask them and say, try to get that uh, uh, resolved somehow. And that's that's why the best is if well, everyone uses by default the permissible license because then that happens rarely. Otherwise, I think you have to rewrite it. It doesn't fit. 
Yeah, I think uh, that you, what you just pointing out is is uh, the application of reality to the whole problem, right? So in my project, I'm reusing, let's say, 50 different libraries, source codes, whatnot, with 50 different licenses. And I would have to go to each of the projects and, and get into a one year long discussion with the authors of that project, of that software. And while that uh, is ongoing, my project would have uh, to just pause because I have no permission to do what I need to do with the help of their source code, right? And uh, so, yeah, there's there, yeah, there's the friction, right? Um, if I want to play it nice, this is what I have to do. Uh, in reality, we all know what we do, do we? No, I must say I do that. <laughs> I run around to everyone. Maybe one or the other already got a mail from from me about that and asked that doesn't fit very well in our system. Could you please really sign your software? And I would recommend that and that license for that. And that works, I must say. But from time to time, you always then run into that institute stuff where people say, well, that's our institute who enforces that. And then I ask, could you please ask your institute and so on. That's that's something, but it is worth, I think, because at the end, we all benefit from that. So if, if someone's license doesn't fit to your project, it may also not fit to other projects. So it's not just that, well, if, if everyone just, just thinks, well, let's hide that problem and let's do whatever, then we will have that mess for a long time. If we just start to work it out, whenever it appears, then we can solve that slowly. Absolutely right, Ole. Problem is, I've got my tasks and uh, trying somebody else to reapply a new license or apply a new license or relicense their code is solving actually somebody else's problem because it's their problem that they applied a license that is not compatible with my work in the first place, right? So it's kind of a going forth and back problem and reshifting re re responsibilities there. So, and I'm a lazy person. So I just don't, right? Uh, I'm taking the devil's advocate's uh, place here, right? So I just ignore all that and ju I just potter on and, and uh, well, use the code as it is. And I don't care about the license. Yeah, but then really, so quick, the one, one of the points there is in the moment I want to take that for Debian, I will discover that and then I will have the problem. And I will, of course, first ask all the people, but. I end up, and that happened, uh, happened even last year, uh, that the software can't be published in Debian, even if it is in principle open source. Yes. But because I think people then use some software where they didn't have permissions for it, or the permission doesn't extend to me, or whatever. But I think that and you. That, you and that, that limits, at the end, it limits the usefulness of your software. So if you are one to have your software somewhere, that people use it and well, in that sense we are scientists we want to be uh, famous for writing our software then we, we should put some efforts in that well what you say there that uh, if it's not in debian it would limit the distribution of my software but it depends if i put it on uh on some other web page where everybody can download it, right? It's uh, even dis Linux distribution independent and people on uh, Solaris could use it. Sure, sure. But uh, I, uh, it, it, the distribution is larger, I could package it. Yeah. I don't insist on that, but uh, uh, it's, it's more or less just, just the offer. And in, in principle, everyone else comes into the same problem and someone may have a picky law uh, enforcement in his institutes, which says you can't use that software. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, that, that that's one of the advantages that you have is that you can tell people, look, I mean, I can give you world fame, but you have to change your license. And it may be different when I say, I can give your software to be used as part of the law for software stack, but you will have to change your license. I think there is a, a bit of a in that sense, you have a lot of power, Ole, and, and we're all very happy with that, but in this com in this specific way. Yeah, but let me then ask, okay, so we have now Ole, who has leveraged through the Debian project, right? A, a worldwide known project that has a lot of leverage. 
to some, to some not, but uh, quite, quite a following. So what other solutions are there? What other solutions have you found uh, when you struggled with uh, this license is incompatible with that license and I need both of these things in my project? What have you done? Is that the question to me or is that just a common question? I think it's common, common one. one. E so, everybody, everybody. Um, we have 90 people here in the BOF, so I, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to, you know, <laughs> contribute. And I also, I think that part of it also links to the, to actually the other important topic uh, by, by, by in coincidence, but I mean, you not only you have the leverage but you also have a good reason to ask people to change their license in, in as opposed to i'm doing it who's going to court over it right i mean if if, if i link a, a a a gpl thing in my uh, apache 2 application and i'm and nobody cares about it on my site and i can assure you nobody cares about it on my site I mean, what's going to happen? You know, and that also is one of these things where I mean, I, 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 if if I'm lucky, I get an angry email from someone. Mark raises. Well, you don't. At the end. <laughs> I don't even get the. Angry then, email. People, people, people. Well, that, that, that's the point. People are usually helpful. Yes. And uh, uh, and so usually these problems are worked out quite easily. There are a few cases where then people just don't answer anymore because they think, well, that, uh, <laughs> they can't solve it or whatever. Uh, but uh, usually they say, well, let's try it. I will ask them, stay tuned or whatever. When I was saying this, Mark raised his hand. So it at least works a little bit that I, I try to make a strong comment. Ah, thank you. People are raising their hands now. Um, so. First, giving Mark the word and then Tony. And I will mute you for now, Ola. So, Mark, you can unmute. No, you can't. Sorry. Mark, you can unmute. You took it away again. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, so, so, there's a subtle difference here is that a lot of the license restrictions only come into effect um, when you try to redistribute your code. So it may be perfectly legal to take some pieces of software that have somewhat incompatible licenses and use it internally in your institute, as long as you don't offer that software to anybody else. Um, of course, the problem with that is, is that that is not very fair. That's not what we want to do um, because uh, to be proper scientists, um, I, I need to understand what the LOFAR pipeline does and need to look at, at the code that has been run on my data before I got it. Um, so so that's, a, 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 that's an issue. Um, in many cases, of course, especially with those 550 libraries, um, a solution I've taken is, uh, is well, look, if, is there an alternative library that I can use instead of this library that's incompatible with my license? I was I, I was saying thank you, Mark, but then I was not muted. Uh, I was still muted, so I will uh, now ask Tony to 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 get the floor. A, a a new raised hand person, which is always great. You can unmute Tony. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to make a, a couple of related points. One is that someone who owns the license to software can actually relicense it, have multiple licenses at the same time. So if you're asking to use someone's software and they don't want to change their general license, you could request a, a license between you and them for that project. And they would be you know, like, that's legally, uh, depending on, on them, of course, but in a broader legal sense, that's possible. Uh, and the other point to make is that like the standard software engineering technique of trying to modulize the two systems so that they're not really like you may want to use program A and prefer it. It might be your uh, does some mathematical job for you, 
But if you wrap an appropriate interface for it so that someone else could go around and implement something different to obey the same interface, then you may achieve your objective that you can distribute that bit with their license and your bit with your license, and even ask the, the user of the program to download the two bits independently. So there, there are a couple of approaches to this type of problem. Um, so now actually I still see Ole and and oh Mark now un, un, un raised his hand. <laughs> Not sure if 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 Ola actually wanted to keep his hand raised. Hand I think you folks should start wrapping up a little bit. Yes, we should start wrapping up. I know <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> discussion, <laughs> and I I refrained from commenting because it's super interesting, a super super interesting. Yes. Uh, I, so I think I think one of my main conclusions from this, and I, I see it already in our internal group chat, um, this is a topic that a lot of people find interesting because we got a lot of uh, discussion uh, also in the um, um, what's the name in the Discord thing, lots of interest. Uh, also, there is a lot of discussion in the Discord that we haven't even touched on here on licenses and other things than pure software like data, and I seem to. Someone actually noticed there's even discussion on licensing astronomy itself. Um, we'll, uh, so I think that, that, that one of the conclusions is that this discussion is not at all done. Um, we'll be preparing a slide for the Thursday session. And uh, we have been asked to actually already present that slide this, well, my evening, let's phrase it like that, at Peter Turbin's boft. So if you're really curious on what we will conclude from this and you want to know before Thursday, come to Peter's boff. Um, and actually, I think I would love to advertise that one as well, because that one is about uh, software citation. So that touches very closely on uh, on, uh, on licensing. Um, so I think I can wrap up and say thank you very much for joining. Uh, I would like to explicitly thank all the panelists, because you are all awesome. You did a uh, very nice job at preparing, uh, of course, thanking the LOC members to, for all their janitoring duties during this meeting when I forgot to spotlight people or something like that. You all did it, so you're fantastic. So big applause to everybody. And of course, thanks all for joining. I mean, I'm, I'm still amazed that so many people joined the discussion on licensing. I, 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 so I can give the floor back to, to Francesco before I start rambling about how cool everybody is. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you to all the participants and the panelists and everything. The discussion was awesome. Uh, I actually, I actually followed it along and discussed uh, and uh, and uh, uh, liked it a lot. Um, you know, we all have our our uh, ideas, and that's fantastic. And uh, and uh, all the comments were spot on, and uh, you know, great.